My name is Tom Peterson. I'm wel welcoming you to the 25th of our global online biodiversity informatics seminars. This is part of the biodiversity informatics training curriculum. Uh, many of you in recent months have been following a series of seminars on the history of biodiversity informatics. Um, by popular request, we're taking a vacation from that to talk about data cleaning. Um, this is a topic that is crucial and necessary, but maybe not the most exciting in the field. Uh, it's, shall we say, a little bit like cleaning the bathroom in your house. I don't think there's anybody on earth who likes cleaning the bathroom, but it's necessary and everybody does it or should do it so that the bathroom doesn't stink, right? So let's jump into the seminar. Um, I have a presentation. Um, and please send or post questions uh, as I go rather than waiting to the end so that I actually see your questions before we end the broadcast. Um, Okay. So this is not a workflow in this in the computational sense. This is more of a, a program of of thinking that I, I hope that everybody will follow in some form or another. Um, but let's talk about essentially if you're gonna sit down to do some work with biodiversity data, what should you do first? And that is cleaning up your data. So first order of business is here is the uh, email address to which you can send any questions that you have. Um, it Again, it's important that you send them as they come to mind so that I can see them when, I, um, when I'm taking questions. So I'll just point out that if you want more detail on this topic and related topics, um, you can go to the Biodiversity Informatics Training Curriculum. Um, if you notice, here is the, here's the web page for the curriculum, and there is a whole course on cleaning biodiversity informatics data. Um, and you can access the curriculum and that course both by the actual web page, here's the um, URL here up at the top, or um, on the Biodiversity Informatics Journal page, uh, Kate Ingenloff and I have published a, uh, a summary of version 1.2 of the, of the training curriculum. So you can access it as a scientific paper as well. I hope it is, it goes without saying that data cleaning is crucial. Um, biodiversity data sets have gotten extremely large. Just as one obvious example, the data to which uh, the Global Biodiversity and Information Facility provides access to is now more than 650 million records. Okay, it's a huge monstrous, immense data set. And I would posit to you that any data set that's bigger than about 100 records is essentially impossible to, to clean exhaustively. Yeah, we can do a very good job of cleaning a data set, but we probably won't get to every single last possible error. Um, so this thinking takes me to two conclusions. Error will exist in any biodiversity data set, even when we're analyzing it, but that steps should be taken to minimize how much error and how serious that error is. And so essentially what I'm 
what I'm setting out to do in this presentation. Sorry, there we go. What I'm setting out to do in this presentation is to give you a little bit of a recipe and a thinking framework for how to do that data cleaning. So first of all, let's look at some examples, just in case you're not convinced that we need to clean up data before we use them. Uh, here's an early paper uh, led by Catherine Graham, where essentially uh, error was introduced experimentally into biodiversity data sets and species distribution models or ecological niche models were developed. And so in this lower left-hand panel, you can see a graph of the original data and their performance in terms of receiver operating characteristic area under the curve. And on the vertical axis, you can see the performance of the model uh, for the same species, same uh, region, but when the data had had error introduced. The lower left-hand corner of this graph is very poor uh, performance, and the right end is very good performance based on the original data. And all I want you to see is that the models, for the most part, got worse, which is to say most of the points in this, in this two-dimensional space fall below the line of equal performance. And that means that introducing error um, made those models perform less well. And then on the right side of this, of this slide, I'd like you just to notice, um, this is the relative ranking of a bunch of different modeling methods between original data and degraded or error-prone data. And what you can see, for example, is that domain actually increased its rank, but that general linear models and maxent actually reduced in their ranking between uh, original and error-introduced data. The only reason I show you that panel is that it makes a difference. It makes a difference in how these models perform. Here is another biodiversity informatics application. This is a study that some Brazilian colleagues and I did of uh, completeness of knowledge of the plants of Brazil. And what you can see in this map at the right, white areas means essentially no data, blue areas are poorly known, and yellow to red areas are relatively well known. But we cleaned up the taxonomy between, uh, as one step of getting ready to do this study. And so this lower left plot shows you the percentage change in completeness between the raw taxonomy and the clean taxonomy. And it's just a frequency histogram. And what I want you to notice is that zero is somewhere right about here. So essentially none of the grid squares gets better as a consequence of cleaning the data. Sorry, none of them gets worse and all of them get better. And on average, it looks like they're getting better by about 6%. So this does make a difference even to these completeness analyses. Back to niche modeling, uh, here is an illustration of the effects of georeferencing effort. For this study, we produced three different data sets. Um, one that was basically automated georeferencing, one that was what we can call worked. So this is a person knowledgeable about African uh, geography using place names and locating each of the place names. And the third was what we could call researched. And essentially, this is when somebody had access to very detailed original data records and went through each record exhaustively. And all I want you to see is here in panel B, 
is the researched model. So this is the highest quality model. This is for monkeypox virus, which is in Central Africa. But then I want you to notice in the lower two panels, this is the difference between the researched and the automated. And on the lower right panel, the researched and the worked. And all I want you to see is that all of these yellow and orange areas are areas that were underestimated when one used the, um, the automated, the quick and dirty uh, georeferencing. But when one took more care, when one was cleaning up the data and quality checking the data, it actually makes a big difference to the model. Here's another example, um, another African disease example. This is for Lassa fever models. The lower right shows you a model that was published uh, by a group from the University of Oxford. And you can see some pretty serious uh, foci of their prediction of risk. And then notice this effects of quality control. If we quality controlled the data going into the model, these blue areas were emphasized more and more, and these red areas less and less. And so essentially, this area up here at the northern rim of the prediction was missed in the original model from these authors. Um, and that was because they hadn't quality controlled their data. Here's an example regarding uh, Andean and Amazonian plant species in terms of the effects of georeferencing error and the importance of filtering the data. The authors did some very interesting explorations where they compared elevational ranges. This is this left-hand panel. Uh, elevational ranges using all of the data and elevational ranges when they cleaned up the data. And what you can see is that the uncleaned data overestimated the elevational ranges. So with, with cleaned, high-quality data, they were able to appreciate that these species have narrower elevational ranges. And then on this right-hand panel, you see the same effect for range area. So essentially, almost without exception, um, ranges were smaller when the estimates were based on clean data. And they, the authors could appreciate a higher degree of range restriction or endemism uh, when they had cleaned up their data. And then perhaps most recently, here's a, uh, a paper by Guetta and Carmel quantifying the value of user-level data cleaning for big data. And essentially what they did was they looked at, at mammals in Australia. They ran models. Uh, I don't particularly love the, the traditional rock analyses. But what you can see is that between um, three different data treatments, what they call user-level cleaning always gets the highest performance value, which you can see kind of down here in this bottom row of this table. And one of the very interesting things that they did was to, to list the different things that they did to the data. So they initially downloaded a million data points. If the species name was not recognized by the data source, then they had to remove those records. So that's 3,500 records. That's not much. If the um, taxon was not completely identified, 90,000 records were lost. And records with missing or non-Australian coordinates, another 76,000 lost. And so that, what they call uh, essential data cleaning, comes down by 70,000, 80,000, 90,000 records. Sorry, 102,000. But then when they take some more drastic steps, for example, removing the wrong coordinate systems, uh, removing some, some problems with specification of coordinates, 
Uh, looks like none had latitude and longitude switched, uh, but numerical sign confusion. But then you get some big ones with low precision latitude and longitude, old records, unknown year, et cetera, et cetera. Notice that they ended up removing half of the data. Okay, so this is a really crucial point that we lose a lot of biodiversity information because the data are dirty. We're going to come back to this point at the end. So let's take a moment and talk about biodiversity information. And I'm going to be very specific and talk about primary biodiversity data. And I'll define these records as those data records that integrate three dimensions taxon okay and this is essentially a species level identification obviously when species level identification doesn't exist um, some level of taxonomic information is better than nothing uh, place uh, obviously gps coordinates which are precise to better than 100 meters generally uh, gps coordinates are best Text-derived coordinates, essentially like, you know, what are what is the latitude of, longitude of the point that's 10 kilometers north of New York City? Coordinates like that will be precise at a coarser level, better than nothing. And in fact, it's what we have for all of the biodiversity records prior to GPS. And then finally, we need uh, to specify our data records in terms of time. And generally, we want day, month, and year. Um, time of day sometimes is also provided, but at least for the sorts of analyses that I'll be talking about today, it's not crucial. So those are the three dimensions that are required for something to be a primary biodiversity data record. A couple of comments about each of these dimensions. For taxon, observational data are really without recourse. If the identification is lacking or incomplete, that record will always be incomplete. When a voucher exists, ideally a specimen, could be a photograph, but with a voucher, um, it's always possible to subject the voucher to further study. And then I'd also like to just mention that many taxon names are perhaps inconsistent or old or not on an authority list like in the Australia analysis. But if the identification is complete, many times we can resolve that to a modern accepted name. And that would then essentially rescue or fix that record. It, it does take time, of course. For place, Yes, GPS coordinates are great, but they're not enough. Uh, GPS coordinates need to be flagged as having been collected with a GPS unit. Otherwise, we might miss the fact that they are GPS quality coordinates. Um, and we also need information on the, the datum and the precision of the coordinates for them to be fully useful. Text-derived coordinates are also useful but I, again, must be accom accompanied by full metadata to be able to interpret them as to what they mean. And for this point, for the, the metadata standards, look at the MANUS georeferencing guidelines as a de facto global standard. And the, the URL is here in the presentation. And coordinate data, whatever the source, should be checked for consistency. And I'll be showing you some ideas for how to check for consistency in just a moment. And finally, time. Usually we specify time in terms of day, month, and year. Obviously, month and year, or just year, are better than nothing. And again, we can check for consistency, at least internally. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. And then we can also check time consistency externally if the data necessary are available. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So here are these three dimensions of a primary biodiversity record. 
We have taxon, place, and time. And I'd just like to show you how some biodiversity analyses fit into this panorama. Um, for example, a, um, a fauna or a flora, uh, just a summary of a taxon, may not depend on place and time. Uh, a gazetteer may depend only on place. Essentially, where are all the places where frog records have been collected in the course of all of the history of a country? Um, for some taxa, we may want to look at trends through time, and that analysis may not be specific to place. Most ecological niche models use only taxon and place information. And we can also look at the sampling history through time for a place. But then here in the middle, in the three-way overlap, we get some analyses, like completeness analyses, like what I showed you for Brazil, and uh, a newer generation of what we could call time-specific ecological niche models which use information on tax on place and time. So what I'm aiming to show you is that we depend on all three of these dimensions, depending on the use of, uh, of the biodiversity data. For this talk, I'm gonna focus on all three of these dimensions. And so I'm gonna stay in this, in this three-way intersection. So, Perhaps less than an absolute workflow, I just want to take you through some typical checks that really everybody should do on every data set that's going to be used. There are some initial steps, then we're going to look at taxon, place, and time, and then we're going to look at some cross-dimensional checks that we can do. So let's start with initial steps. And this is basically just a reminder that we really do need to keep um, whatever the unique identifier is in a data set. If we lose that unique identifier, then we can have trouble getting our nice clean data back to the original uh, record. And then we also want to get rid of some extraneous fields that perhaps are not directly relevant to a particular set of cleaning and analyses. So I've highlighted in different colors the fields that I thought to use in this particular analysis, and then I can remove them. And so long as I have that unique identifier, I know I can go back to the original data records. And so notice that here in this lighter green, I have time information. And in red, I have uh, taxon information and um, in the darker green, I have place information. And so all I've done is kind of reduce my data set so it's a little more manageable. So those are just some, some quick reminders about initial steps. Now let's talk about taxon. And again, these are simple uh, checks, and I'm not showing you any of the technology that could be used to this end. Um, for example, I downloaded from VertNet data on the birds of Nicaragua, and I got a bunch of dots on the map. But let's just look at the list of species, okay? And right away, we see some things that are concerning. For example, here we have a bunch of records, six of them, that just say Formicarius. Uh, this is an ant bird, obviously, given the name, but it doesn't have a species level ID. And so this is a, these six records are things that we would have to discard. And then also in some records like this, Formicarius and then Hoffmani in parenthesis with a question mark, that's non-standard text, and that's going to cause us trouble if we try to use these data for something. If it's for a completeness analysis, it can even show up as a unique record and bias our completeness calculations downward. 
Let's keep going. Here we see Ramphacilla sanguina lenta, Africa, question uh, mark. Again, non-standard text. And then over here, uh, we see that some of these records for this species, sanguina lenta, are under sanguina lenta, and some under, are under sanguina lentus. So this is the same species. It's just a disagreement about gender of the genus and how the species epithet should match it. And then down here at the bottom, we see Ropoterpe stictoptera. And I've worked with Central American birds for quite a while, but I did have to look that one up. Uh, that actually, that name refers to Mermornis torquata. So that was easily interpretable, but it did take some human intervention or a very good data set that um, would have synonyms. So my point in this is just that these data sets have a lot of garbage. And we want to find and flag that garbage, first of all, to avoid biasing our results, but second of all, also to avoid losing data. If you look at Ramphacilla sanguinolentus or sanguinolenta, we could easily lose most of our data or half of our data just because our authority list has a different name. If it was under, if the authority list lists sanguinolentus, then all of those sanguinolenta go into the garbage can and we lose data. So different uh, taxa will have different sources of authority lists. Uh, we can use published floras and faunas. We can use checklists like this one for, for the birds of Nicaragua. Um, or we can, in, in the worst case, we can simply use the broader mass of data records and just look for inconsistencies. My point is there are technology tools behind this to compare our list with, a, um, with an authority list, we might use Microsoft Excel to pick out non-matching names on the, the data set list. To pick out those near identical names like Sanguinolentus and Sanguinolenta, uh, we could use uh, OpenRefine. And actually, we will have a a course being incorporated into the biodiversity informatics training curriculum uh, in the next few months that will show you how to use Refine, which is a very good uh, tool for this, this sort of question. OK, let's go on to time. And this, was, this was fun. Um, I was playing with a data set on the, uh, the plants of Ghana. And I was just looking at time information. And this is very, very uh, easy to do. In fact, I did these explorations in Excel. And you can see I got, this is just the end of the list, but 2001, 2002, 2003. And then the year 2956 and the year 2965. Now, maybe those are records collected by the Starship Enterprise and reported back to us. Or I'm guessing that's actually 1956 and 1965. Maybe I could guess that more firmly by looking at the collector information. And if the collector of these particular records was active in the 50s and 60s, maybe I can rescue those, those records. But in the most strict sense, get rid of them. I can look at months. And using, using a number to denote month is always a little dangerous because, for example, every place, every place in the world uses a date system which is day, month, year, except the beautiful United States of America, which for some god-awful reason uses a non-hierarchical month, day, year date system. And so that frequently introduces problems. And notice here we have month 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, and 10, 11, 12, but then also month 18, month 20, and month 24. 
of those are problems. Again, we might be able to pick that out via collector itineraries. When, what days was this collector in a particular place? But definitely those are problem records. If I look at days just in terms of frequency, notice all I'm doing is playing with the data. I have this big zero category, which means missing data. And then correctly, the day 31 is less frequent. And that makes sense because a bunch of months don't have 31 days. I'll come back to this in a moment. I can look at months, and here are the uh, frequencies of records in different months. And I notice there's a big pulse of accumulation of records in December. Maybe that's dealing with uh, Christmas time leave or something, or maybe that's an opportune time of the season. You can see my months 18, 20, and 24 have only single records in them, so it's not a big problem. Then I did something just for fun. I made a table of the month versus the day. And so here are those three um, high-value months. So we can kind of ignore those. But then notice that here in February, I have nine records from February 30th, which never exists, and five records from February 31st, one record from April 31st, and one record from uh, September 31st. So I know those are all internally inconsistent dates, which is to say, within the data record itself, those don't make sense. But then I can go one step farther. Sorry, notice these 90 February 29th. And OK, it's a good low number compared to 198 for February 28th, because we know that that leap year occurs only every four years. So I simply looked at the interaction between records of February 29th and the year. And so 1940 was a leap year, and we have one record on February 29th that year, and 44 and 48 and 52. But look at this. In 1953, we have three records <clears throat> from February 29th. In 1965, we have a record, 1970, two in 1971. And so again, those are internally inconsistent data records. The time, the place, and the taxon may be perfectly usable, but definitely, definitely, I've got a problem with my date. And then I can just look at frequency of years, and I see this is on a log scale, so from here to here is a tenfold increase. I see huge amounts of collecting and, and accumulation of records um, in the 1920s to 1970s. I see fewer and fewer records going back into the 19th century, but then I have some records that are just clearly mistakes. So notice that what I'm doing in all of this is just exploring data. I'm just playing with data. I'm, I'm doing graphs and doing tables that respond to possible ways that error could enter my data set. Let's go on and look at uh, place, and we're going to look at a bunch of uh, consistency questions. This is from the University of Ghana Herbarium, and this, by using this, their example is in no means a criticism. These same data problems exist in everybody's data. And in fact, I'll show you the data set that I curate here at the University of Kansas in a moment, and you'll see problems that are just as bad. Um, but that is the world down there at the bottom. And some of my coordinates are so bad that they pop off of the map of the world. So let's zoom in. And we still see some problems. This, so this, this map um, has some symptoms that we should be able to recognize, because we'll find them fairly frequently. 
For example, this point is the most commonly georeferenced collecting point on Earth. Guess what that is? It's not um, a place where all the collectors go. Rather, it's zero, zero. So it's missing latitude and missing longitude. Now, I'm also seeing some striping, okay? And that's kind of suggesting to me that maybe a Ghanaian locality is erroneous. But I, I'm wondering why those vertical stripes are existing. And, and I don't have a good answer for that, but it's certainly symptomatic of problems. And see, I can see the striping now, both in vertical and horizontal dimensions. So it suggests that maybe I've got a mistake in my interpretation of the coordinates uh, or in how the coordinates were recorded in this data set. Um, I can color in all the Ghanaian records, and so those are shown as in red here. And notice that we have some Ghanaian records in Togo and in Benin and in Nigeria, and in fact in Cote d'Ivoire and out in the ocean. So we should check to make sure those are indeed marine plant taxa. I hope they are. Um, but these are just basic explorations. And so to do these explorations in more detail, what I can do is I can use this point sampling tool. The icon is shown here. Um, in other programs like ARC, it's called uh, Extract Data to Point. But essentially what we can do is we can take the point coordinates and attach to them the values of rasters. I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Or of uh, vector data. And we get a table that looks like this. Here's the country name in this column. Uh, the country name that refers, that's, that's listed in the biodiversity data record. But then over here under name, we have the country name where those coordinates fall. And so you can see in these records, the record is specified as coming from Ghana, but the coordinates don't fall within Ghana, okay? And then in other cases, I'm gonna go forward one, we have a country name in the data record that says Ghana, but the coordinates fall in Togo, or a country name that says Cameroon, and the coordinates fall in Ghana. So these are records in which different parts of the record are inconsistent with other parts, which is to say the text-based description of country disagrees with the coordinates and where they actually fall. This doesn't mean that the coordinates are wrong. It means that there's a problem somewhere and that these, these records have a higher probability of holding a problem. Again, this is just data exploration and it's what I would encourage you to do. Let's go back to our birds of Nicaragua example. We have some offshore records, which could be fine because bird watchers and bird collectors indeed hire boats and go offshore to accumulate records of pelagic bird species. We've got four sites that are oh, excuse me, listed as Nicaragua, but the coordinates actually fall in Honduras, so that probably is a problem. But then I'm just going to do another little trick, and it's the same thing I just showed you for country, but I'm going to give a different symbol for each uh, major division, state. And so, for example, look at these black crosses. Um, all of these records fall in this one state. One is offshore. That may be okay. And the same with the red X's, except a couple of those are here in this region. And these black dots are pretty consistent, except for this one offshore and these two up here. These red circles are completely consistent, I believe. But what I want you to see is that we can right away pick out a lot of situations where 
uh, our coordinate system probably has some problems or our description of state boundaries. And in some cases, it just means that state boundaries have been redrawn, but we should at least check. So again, these are data manipulations we can do to check for internal consistency in our data records. Now I'm going to show you two examples of external consistency. Um, and these are mostly related to place, but place or time, place by time, place by taxon gives us some interesting opportunities. So when we have enough density of data, we can take all of the records for a particular collector and we can put them in order by date. So for example, here are collecting localities for Alan Phillips between the 2nd of October and the 10th of October in 1955. And what I want you to notice is that on the 2nd of October, he was up here in the Northwest. By the 5th of October, he's down here in the Mexican state of, Nica of, of Nayarit. And during this period, he is traveling around Nayarit. We see him on the 5th, on the 6th, on the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. But then notice there's this record down in Guerrero, which is a long way away, on the 8th. There's a record in Nayarit on the 8th. So that was either a very quick plane flight, and I guarantee you it wasn't, or it's a problem. It could be a problem with the name of the collector. It could be a problem with the date, or it could be a problem with the locality. Not clear, but definitely worth checking. So what we did was we implemented this itinerary checking for a bunch of uh, collectors. Notice my colleague Adolfo Navarro. Uh, just for fun, we included his records as well. Uh, so here's Adolfo. Here's uh, Wilmot Brown, uh, Chester Lamb, Alan Phillips, and Mario del Toro Aviles. These are the the latter four are the most prolific uh, bird collectors in Mexico, and you can see the numbers are staggering. 34,000 bird specimens collected by Chester Lamb. 1,220 collected by my colleague Adolfo. But notice that we picked out two problems uh, even amongst Adolfo's um, records. And when we looked at them, indeed what they were were problems in georeferencing, uh, essentially typographical errors in typing in a latitude and longitude coordinate. Not Adolfo's fault, but at some point in the data capture process. And what we did was we filtered our errors or our possible errors by allowing a certain radius of movement. Uh, so that was collected, that was calculated using this compl complicated formula from spherical trigonometry, but we allowed a certain radius of movement per day. And so movements within one day, movements um, between one day and the next, or between two days and the next, one day and two days later, and one day and three days later. And essentially what you see is we're allowing more movement between consecutive and non-consecutive days. So amongst 1,200 records from Adolfo, we find two errors. Um, but the error rates are tenfold higher amongst the older collectors. Uh, one and a half percent for Wilmot Brown, 2.1 percent for Chester Lamb, 10 percent for Alan Phillips, and 3.6 percent for Del Toro Aviles. In the case of these four collectors, uh, Adolfo and I know quite a bit about these collectors and where these errors probably come from. For Brown and Lamb, they appear to be, uh, shall we say, random errors that had to do with maybe a little bit of carelessness, but managing large numbers of records. Del Toro Aviles was actually discovered by Alan Phillips 
as not labeling his specimens, especially late in his life. And so a lot of the specimens have essentially random, um, at least date, if not locality, because Del Toro Avila stopped labeling his specimens and would only label them when he was going to sell them to a museum. So Del Toro Avila is kind of a famous case of, of um, data problems in Mexican ornithology. Um, but the funny thing is the error rates are much larger when it comes to Alan Phillips. And they, there are two possible reasons for this. One is that Phillips may have put some of uh, specimens collected by his team of collectors under his name. And that would be a rather innocuous source of problems. But also, uh, it is fairly well known that Phillips also was relabeling specimens because he was known, shall we say, to snitch specimens, uh, especially from Mexican museums, uh, when they were of particularly interesting taxa. So Phillips um, committed some rather serious sins in changing the data associated with some specimens. Let's look at another set of uh, consistency, external consistency questions. Let's now cross time and place, or sorry, taxon and place. So we're going to look at two of my favorite birds in the world. These are jays in the genus Cyanolica. Uh, you can see they are beautiful. One is in eastern Mexico and Central America, and the other is in western Mexico. Uh, let's look first at the one from eastern Mexico. I'll make use of these polygon data sets from the uh, IUCN and BirdLife and NatureServe. Uh, these are essentially species-by-species species summaries of known distributions of species. They are not very useful for the fine-grained aspects of species ranges, but they certainly can help us pick out the big, um, the big features of species ranges. And I just want you to notice this record, which is too far north and too far west, I'm actually guessing it may just be georeferenced to the centroid of Mexico. But regardless, that's definitely not a record of uh, azure hooded jay cyanolica cuculata. And yet it's in there in the, in the online data sets. I tried the same approach for cyanolica mirabilis, um, and it didn't really pick anything out for me. You can see the uh, the range summary is very general. Notice this long, straight range limit, which is wrong. I can certainly tell you that. Um, so really, the IUCN BirdLife NatureServe data sets didn't do us any good for this species. So instead, I plotted those occurrence records for this species. This is this cluster of points up here um, on a very fine resolution digital elevation model. And red is high elevation and blue is low elevation. And I just want you to notice that this is a montane species. So let's zoom in and look at each of these points. Notice that this one might be too low. So I'm kind of suspicious of that. But first we're gonna zoom in and look at these two points in, oh, sorry about my phone going off. Um, and hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me your patience for one moment and I will get rid of this. It's gone. Not because of anything I did. Okay, so I can use that same uh, point sampling tool or extract value to point to get the elevations of each of these points, and I can create a histogram, and you can see that point is an outlier. So now I want to look at it on real-world geography. So I'm going to go to Google Earth. Let me go back just so I don't disorient you. 
First, we're going to look at these two points. Then we're going to look at these points and then this one. So first, these two points, here they are. This is um, Cerro Teotepec, a volcano in the Sierra Madre del Sur of Mexico. Acapulco is down here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I believe that in 1988, I collected this record near Puerto de Ga del Gallo. Uh, this is Mount Teotepec, and this is another old record. So this is on the coastal slopes of, of the Sierra Madre del Sur. Those are correct. Um, let's look at that middle cluster. Uh, there's an old collecting locality called Omiltemi, which I believe is somewhere in this valley. Uh, but this area definitely holds this species, and I am not terribly concerned about the accuracy. This record is a little bit low, but uh, I believe the species could easily be present there. But you remember there was that one lower elevation uh, locality that was slightly farther east. Look at that one. Okay, this is the city of Chopancingo. And notice that our record falls right in the city of Chopancingo. Chopancingo is in a dry valley. Uh, Sinaleca mirabilis never, um, never occurred there. Um, and in fact, now because, um, now because I know a bit about the history of these sampling records, I can tell you that Wilmot Brown uh, georeferenced a lot of his specimen records to Chopancingo. Um, either because he was aggregating things just kind of vicinity of Chopancingo, or because uh, he was paying village children to bring him dead birds and some of those kids may have gone up into the surrounding mountains to get um, specimens for him. So I think this is a record that's clearly erroneous and should be removed from the data set. Notice that the data on the tag of this specimen says Chopin single. This is not a georeferencing problem. This is a problem with the original data. And so the georeferencing was correct. It's just that the record is wrong. So we need to deal with that if we're going to use these data. Okay, so that's essentially walking you through a bunch of exercises in data exploration essentially just playing with your data before you derive any conclusions from your data and use your data in analyses. Let's think about this just a little bit more. In that data set, sorry, in that study of Andean and Amazonian plant species, um, the authors did a very interesting um, assessment of data losses. Um, Essentially, what they show is the number of records that meet the collection criterion, sorry, the number of species that meet the criterion of at least 30 records after uh, standard filters, which are shown in gray, and um, elevational data filters, which are shown in dark gray. And what I want you to see is that the number of species that we can analyze goes down by almost 40%. Um, and then also we can see the number of species eliminated. And so we're seeing losing huge numbers of species from the analysis. Uh, I promised you I would criticize the KU Ornithology data set as well, and so I will. Here are tax on time and place um, for the KU ornithology data set. In taxon, we're largely good. Um, there are a few non-standard names, which basically just means that my dear colleague Mark Robbins is updating the taxon names so quickly to match current taxonomic opinion that some of those names are not in the authority lists. With regarding time, we're mostly okay, but a non-trivial portion of the records, maybe a tenth or a twelfth of the records, 
don't have date information. Those are older records. It's in place where we really blow it. About a third of the records are fine. Um, about a third of the records have no coordinates, but do have full textual georeferences. And so those data are rescuable. And then um, another set of records have coordinates, but they're, with, they're lacking metadata, absolutely. So if I, if I put taxon time and place all together for the KU Ornithology data set, I get this. The ones that are OK are less than half. The ones that are essentially without hope are about a tenth. So for that white section of the pie, I cannot get a full time taxon and place biodiversity data record together because some one of those three or two or three of those three are lacking. And then the very interesting point is all of this gray segment is fixable. Those are data records where, with a little bit of work or a lot of work, we can get a georeference, a time, and a place. So I'd really like you to think of this as a pipe bringing water maybe to your house. You can see this poor guy is only getting drops of water out of his shower because he's got leaks here and there all through his system. So we can think about digital accessible knowledge as a pipeline that has leaks. So if we start with all of biodiversity and all of the sampling of biodiversity, some specimens got lost, some records got lost, some records and specimens have not been identified, some are not in digital format, some have not been cleaned, some have not been georeferenced, some have not been published. Some have been published but not under standard formats and standard protocols, and some have not been integrated. And only the data that survive all of those filters, only those data are usable. All of these arrows that I have circled represent information loss. They're leaks in our data pipeline. And my point in promoting data cleaning is that if we plug those leaks, we immediately get payoff in terms of usable information. Indeed, if we put, plug this last leak, then everything that's survived up to this point becomes usable. If we plug the first leak, it's useful, but those data may still get, get lost at some subsequent point. So we get a very interesting strategy. We should plug our leaks from the most proximate to the most basal, and that will have the most immediate payoff in terms of usability of information. OK, so let's just go through some brief conclusions. Uh, data cleaning can be very effective. Um, it allows us to detect and remove problem records. It allows us to signal or flag records that can be fixed, which will allow us to build the data set available bigger and better. In my opinion, automated georeferencing, fully automated georeferencing, is pretty scary, which is to say, I showed you an example of a study that indicates that uh, it inserts noise in our uh, niche models. Uh, but I also showed you an example that indicates that a locality can be correctly georeferenced, which is to say, yes, those are the coordinates of that place, but it was wrong for that species. I would say that any full automation of, in this case, niche modeling or distribution modeling is an extremely bad idea. You're starting to see workflows where you know, such and such workflow pulls the data in from GBIF and goes ahead and calibrates a model. 
I think that's a very bad idea. Why? Because none of those efforts, none of those initiatives incorporates significant hands-on human eyes looking at data cleaning steps. And I've just talked with you for an hour about why those steps are so important. So to be honest, data cleaning is a slow by hand process. It can be made more efficient using tools from technology, but it really does require ha human hands and human brains and human eyes to do it very well. Okay, so those are uh, some thoughts about how one would go about cleaning a biodiversity data set. I apologize if anybody was expecting a real computational workflow. Uh, this was a thinking workflow. More than anything, my point is play with your data. Get in there, play with your data. Um, so the email address for questions about this talk biodivtraining at gmail.com, or you can use my personal email, town at ku.edu. I'm going to come out of the presentation so I can see if there are any questions. Uh, but note down that. Please send me questions. And we're going to stop sharing the screen, start sharing my face. Um, any questions? Um, okay, looks like Angela may have a question. Angela, would you care to state your question? Let's see. Okay, waiting for your question, Angela. Let me check the BioDiv training. Let's see. Aha! Now I see the question. Hold on one second. Angela Cuervo from Mexico asks, do you have additional recommendations for cleaning data sets of invasive species? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, there are two things that I would point out. There's probably more if, if I or somebody smarter than me were to think about it. Um, one point is that uh, invasive species are um, are oftentimes tough in terms of um, being sure that they are established and invasive. Uh, many of these very famous invasive species are ones that's that are very good at dispersal. And so a very important point may be to, um, filter points, filter sites, to make sure that they really do have established populations of the invasive species and not just dispersers. Uh, in honor of my father, I'll, I'll remind um, you all of a point in the literature that's been lost for decades. Um, a malacologist at the Field Museum in the 1980s used the term uh, Robinson Crusoes because a lot of the species he was interested in would send out essentially single dispersers that had no way of reproducing. And so they were going to be stranded on the island with no hope, hope of reproduction. And so um, this researcher referred to them as Robinson Crusoes. Uh, my father was a literature, literary critic who studied Robin, uh, Robinson Crusoe. Um, so I think 
with invasive species, before you count a site as being positive for a place, it's probably important to uh, look for some level of repeat occurrence. And that will be very helpful in cleaning up the data set. Um, the other point about invasives, it's more of a, uh, shall we say, a cynical point about invasives is that many, many times uh, biodiversity sampling is not done very well for um, non-native species. And that means that the sampling will frequently be very poor, uh, particularly in uh, the invaded regions, which is to say very good botanists may go out to um, really interesting sites and um, may uh, accumulate records of native plants or native insects and may ignore totally the non-native ones when sometimes those are the crucial records. Many thanks for your, um, for your time and for tuning in. And I wish you all a good remainder of the day. And uh, take care. Bye-bye.